Hello and welcome to The Wire. You're watching Farm Talks and I am Indra Shekhar Singh. Today, we are going to be talking about a recent announcement by the Modi government. It talks about giving highly subsidized rations to 75% of the rural population and 50% to urbanites. This is done under a 2013 act called the National Food Security Act. Now, this act entails that highly subsidized wheat, paddy and some other cereals will be given out to people who need them through the PDS system. Apart from the subsidized rations, there are also clauses for providing rations, free of cost rations to pregnant women, to growing children and other and other such vulnerable groups. Now, what has happened is that although the Modi government has used an old act from 2013 to, to, to resurface again for one year, but the real problem is, which experts are saying, that the Modi government has stopped the scheme which was the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anni Yojana, which was providing free ration to people during the COVID era. Now, very smartly, the Modi government has shifted gears from providing free ration to providing highly subsidized rations. Many experts are also calling this move as a way to win votes and, and ensure that the Modi government gets the votes it needs in 2023-24. So, of course, there are many political discussions. This idea of the National Food Security Act is not a new one. Similar, similar legislations and similar provisions have been made since the time of Julius Caesar. Even the Romans offered subsidized rations to its people so that they could afford it and build the nation. Today, the Modi government, India finally has come about to this decision and implemented this act, which was already passed in 2013. Now, to discuss this act further, I have two experts with me on the show, economist Jean Rez and former Agriculture Secretary Shiraz Hussain, who will be telling us about the nitty-gritties of these acts. And I begin with Jean. Like, Jean, could you please explain to us what is the National Food Security Act and what was the real intention behind it? So I think that the basic idea was, first of all, to end hunger and to provide the minimum of economic security and food security to everyone. There are huge numbers of people in India, I would say a majority of the population, who live in very precarious conditions. They are poor to start with, and they are exposed to all kinds of contingencies. Sometimes it is illness, crop failure, unemployment. Now we have new contingencies like COVID, climate change, and so on. So they are very insecure. And the idea is to bring a minimum of economic security in their lives with these food rations, which are not very much, of course, five kilos per person per month. It's not much at all. But it does ensure that there is food in the house at all times. And I think that really is important for poor people. We should remember, however, that the Food Security Act is not just about the public distribution system. There are also very important provisions related to child nutrition, the uh, provision for uh, school, me uh, school meals and also midday meals under the Integrated Child Development Services. And very importantly, in fact, I think this is the most important provision of the Act, is universal maternity entitlements. Unfortunately, the provision for maternity entitlements has been sidelined. In fact, it's been violated by the central government for the last 10 years. But to my mind, it's a very important provision. Very few countries, certainly in the developing, wor the developing world, have uh, universal maternity entitlements. Again, it's not very much, 6,000 6, rupees per child is really too little, but the principle is very important and the entitlements can be and should be expanded over time. So I think that was the basic idea of the act. Uh, I'd like to now move to Shiraz Hussain. So what do you think is the real shift here, you know, you, from moving from the Pradhan Mantri, Garib Kalyan, Anaj Yojana, which provided free food drains. Now we move to a point and that too for one year only where people can get highly subsidized rations. Do you think that the Indian administration system and the Indian food reserves can take care of this? Are we, are we equipped enough, strong enough to take this burden upon our economy and upon our farmers? Actually, Indra, there is no additional burden. In fact, as far as the government is concerned, government is reducing its commitment to provide uh, food grains because before the <laughs> Uh, Pradhan Mantri Gharib Kalyan Anni Yojana was introduced under the National Food Security Act. 
the beneficiaries were only getting 5 kilograms of food grains per person per month then pm gkay gave them 5 kilograms additional food grains free of cost so now that additional food grains has been withdrawn which means that the government's uh, commitment overall commitment to provide the quantum of food grains will now be lower uh, sir but here i think this is a question to 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 both of you can i elaborate on this sure please but So uh, I think what Siraj has said is correct. So basically, there are two things happening at the same time, and it's not an accident that they, they are being packaged together. One is the discontinuation of PMGKY, so the discontinuation of additional food rations that happened in the last two years, and the other move is the reduction of issue prices under the Food Security Act from three rupees per kilo for rice and two rupees per kilo for wheat to zero. now the reduction of prices is neither here nor there it's not going to help people very much i mean think of the person who used to pay 2 rupees a kilo for 5 kilos of wheat per month so they were paying 10 rupees a month now they are going to save 10 rupees because they are going to get it for free so 10 rupees a month of subsidy is not going to make a difference to anybody nor is this going to cost the central government very much okay but what it's going to do is sweeten the pill of the other move which is the really big move and that is the discontinuation of the extra free rations now i don't think that the pmgky was sustainable as it was because we don't have these food stocks required for that uh, let let me clarify this because it's important to understand the arithmetic a little bit the food security act requires something like 60 million tons of food grain per year okay That's the procurement level around 2013 when the act came into force, but the procurement levels have increased by leaps and bounds in the meantime to 70 million tons per year, 80 million tons per, 90 million tons per year, and in the last two years, not this year but the previous two years, for the first time, more than 100 million tons per year for in two for two years in a row, and that's for the food stocks have been ballooning. despite 60 million tons being offloaded every year under the food security act now the pmgky has hidden that imbalance or you can say it has temporarily resolved that imbalance in the last two years by hugely increasing the distribution because the distribution was virtually double so it would be now more than 100 million tons and therefore the stocks have been coming down but now pds with pmgky is more than what we are procuring so if you continue the stocks are going to start melting much below the buffer stock norm so in that sense it was not sustainable but if you discontinue it i feel that what you are saving from discontinuing it which is a lot of money it's one and a half lakh crores per, uh, per year roughly that should be reinvested in social security measures like giving ration cards to people who don't have them uh investing in health in school education and in social security measures like pensions and maternity entitlements including very importantly proper implementation of the food security act because the modi government has been savagely cutting the budget for midday meals and lcds in the last 8 years and as i mentioned earlier violating the provisions for maternity entitlements so that money could have been very well used uh, by being reinvested in social security and i'm afraid that may not happen i mean we will get to know in the next budget but i fear that it will not hap- not happen in which case what is happening now is a great reduction of social support which is being sweetened by reducing the issue price to zero under the national food security act so so uh, now uh, hussain sahab like you've also written articles against this move so could you now tell us that what are some of your disagreements with this policy decision Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For you, yes. No, actually, what I have written is that the move to make it totally free is uh, not desirable uh, because uh, the government has declared that these free food grains will be available till December two thousand twenty-three. It means that in the run-up to parliament elections, 
which are due in May 2024, it is very unlikely that the government will start charging anything for uh, you know the central issue price. Uh, so, which means it will uh, it is going to continue at least till May 2024, and even after that, it is very unlikely that it will continue. In the process, the central government is taking an additional burden of about 15,000 crores. I agree with uh, Mr. John Rees that uh, there is a need to uh, increase the budgetary allocation for several welfare schemes. I have myself written several articles with Mr. Jugal Mohapatra, who was Secretary of Rural Development, for increasing the old age pension, for example, the widow pension. You know, they are additional amounts. Many state governments like Andhra Pradesh and Telangana have added to that out of their own budget. But the poor, poorer states of India, Northern India, Eastern India have not done that much. In addition to that, uh, you know, social welfare scheme, I would have uh, recommended to the government that there is a need to invest more in agricultural research so that we can develop climate resistant technologies. Mr. Gene Rees sits in Jharkhand. He works in Jharkhand. He knows it very well that from time to time, there are uh, droughts. There are, for example, this year itself, there is drought. Then there are floods in Bihar. So there is a need to develop technologies uh, for both paddy, wheat, and other crops so that we are able to produce enough uh, to feed our large population. Sure. And see, this is the question to any of you who want to answer this. Now, the Act allows for 75% of the rural population to be covered under the scheme and 50% of urbanites. Now, how many of these, how many people do you think will actually be taking the benefit of the scheme? Would there be any guesses at all? Can I come back to some of... Go ahead, Mr. Please. Sorry. Mm -hmm. sure. um, let, me, let me stress once again that the reduction of issue price to zero from virtually zero because you know two rupees per, k per k kg for wheat is virtually zero so reducing from virtually zero to zero that's not of any consequence the big move is not that the big move is the discontinuation of pmgky and that's where i think something objectionable going on the, the reduction of price as i said it's partly sweetening the pill and also very importantly it's a very clever political move to steal the show and steal the credit of the National Food Security Act. Because what is going to happen now is that people are going to be, they're going to get the impression and the impression will be created that they are getting free food from Modi or from the Modi government, when actually they're getting it from the Food Security Act and the Modi government is just adding a tiny extra subsidy. Um, so I think what we need to focus on is the reduction of the food rations and the PMGKY and how that money should be reinvested. Now, you asked the question about coverage. The coverage is built into the Act. It's 75% of rural population, 50% of urban population. Personally, I feel this is quite reasonable. In fact, if anything, I would say it's on the low side. Uh, we must also remember that the actual coverage now is much lower because the population has increased and the coverage has not been adjusted accordingly because the government didn't conduct the 2021 census. So the actual coverage now is below 60%. And that's another way in which I feel that the present government is undermining the National Food Security Act. So the money that's being saved by discontinuing PMGKY, I think should at least partly be used to provide ration cards to some people who don't have them, because we must remember that many poor people don't have a ration card. For example, in Jharkhand, where I live, as uh, Siraj Hussain mentioned, there's a big problem of young couples don't ha not having ration cars because they got married after 2011 when the social economics and car census, census was conducted and that is the basis of the distribution of ration cars in Jharkhand. so those who married after that for them it's very hard to get a ration card so why not give them ration card now that you are saving all this money i think that will be uh, much better than you know agricultural research i don't dispute it's important of course it's important but I think the budget for health and social security in India is far too low. And that's what, what we are saving from it now should be re reinvested within that sector. Um, Mr. Hussain, now a question for you. Like It's already been mentioned that the Indian stock food reserves are at its lowest. And we already had not a very good paddy harvest and neither the wheat was not well either. 
Now, if again we see a repeat of that in 2023, do we, will this scheme burden the food economy further? And, are, is, and schemes like this, will they actually push India towards food inflation? Uh, actually, if, God forbid, the wheat crop is again impacted by high temperatures in February and March, as it did last year, uh, then um, it is quite uh, possible that uh, the procurement level will not be adequate uh, to meet the requirement of National Food Security Act. So, I am um, hoping that the winter will be good and the temperature uh, will be low enough, about 15 degrees Celsius, so that the wheat crop matures well. And uh, uh, as I said, if there is a shortfall, then it may be difficult for the government to procure. So what that will entail is very unpleasant. That will attract uh, and persuade the government to bring measures which will force the farmers to sell to the government at MSP, which means that the government will do everything to bring down the market prices so that the government is able to procure from the farmers at MSP. So that will harm the farmer's interest. There are any number of other consequences. I'm not going into the details. And therefore, uh, we are all hoping, praying, doing everything in our powers to ensure that uh, there is good rubby crop and uh, the rice procurement in the current season is also good. You see, the government has done its bit. Many people have not liked it, but I supported the government move of uh, banning the export of wheat and then restricting uh, the export of rice by imposing 20% duty on non-Basmati rice. So these were all measures to ensure food security for Indian citizens. Move which would have harmed the farmers' interest to some extent, but they were necessary to ensure food security for a large population of India. Now, where I slightly differ from Mr. Jean Rees is the number of people who are covered. You know, many um, experts have argued in different reports, Shanta Committee report, etc., that the coverage should be reduced to 40%. Uh, but you see, in the absence of consumption expenditure survey, etc., we do not know where the poverty is going, even though. Uh, Mr. Surjit, Dr. Surjit Bhalla and Ashok Virmani, etc. have said that the poverty is down to 1%. Some others have said World Bank paper says that poverty is down to 10%. So there should be, you know, from the government side, an informed uh, view as to what, according to the government's assessment, is the level of poverty, so that uh, if, if, there is, if it is possible to bring down the coverage, the government is actually able to do that. Uh, can I differ on this? Sure, please. Uh, please go ahead. You know, the Food Security Act is not just for people who are below the poverty line according to the Indian government's abysmal poverty line criterion. And that's why I began by stressing that it's about protecting people from insecurity because there are people above the poverty line who are nevertheless at risk of poverty. And we need to protect those people as well. Let us not forget that when the act began in 2013 now let us think of this 75 percent coverage in rural areas what does it mean it means or it meant at that time house roughly households that did not earn more than six thousand rupees a month now are you saying that anyone who earns more than six thousand rupees a month maybe today it would mean ten thousand rupees a month anyone who earns more than that doesn't deserve any kind of social support i cannot agree with that i think that uh you know we have to cover a broad range of the population well above the poverty line, also bearing in mind that there are big exclusion errors and we have to take those into account. So I think taking all that into account, a coverage of 75% in rural areas, frankly, I don't think it's unreasonable at all. And the priority today should not be to reduce it, but to implement it, because as I said, the action is percent Sure. Thank you for that. And now I'll move to my last question and I'll allow both of you to answer that. And this one deals with economics. Now, at one way, India is telling the world that we want to be the world leaders. We will have a five trillion economy. And here we have a necessity to, to feed 75% of our rural population, which is mainly producing the food with subsidized rations. What does that say about our economy, our internal strengths, that people in our economy can't even earn enough money to get themselves nutritious food and the government has to provide for it? 
uh, Jean, would you like to take this first or Mr. Hussain? Let's see Raj answer first. No, no, please go ahead. Well, I don't have a lot. I think this delusion that India is a world leader doesn't correspond to anything. I mean, it's just a delusion of the Indian elite. The facts are in front of us. India is still a very poor country in per capita terms. It may have a large GDP because the population is so large, but in per capita terms, it's still one of the poorest countries in the world. And in terms of nutrition, it is among the very uh, worst of countries in the world. So I don't think there's any doubt that India uh, is a poor country where there's a great need to provide some security to poor people and to help them in the terrible situation in which they are. As, a, as an economist and strictly as, a, as an economist, if you're thinking and reflecting on the stats that here India and certain people in India are going debt free, they're, you know, the GDP is booming, the stock market's booming. And here you have a vast majority of Indians who need ration from the government and subsidize rations from the government. There is an active need for that. We know that nutrition doesn't stats... tell me anything. It doesn't tell me anything that I have not known for the last 40 years. I mean, we have known the facts for all this time. We know that there are huge numbers of poor people. We know that there's a huge insecurity. We know that undernutrition under levels are among the highest in the world in India. And we also know that measures like the Food Security Act, midday meals, maternity and entitlements, pensions, school education, healthcare, we know that all these things can do a great deal of good to help them. So I think that for me, this is nothing new in the picture that you described. Thank you. Mr. Hussain, now. Actually, um, you know, this GDP growth, of course, we are a very fast growing economy compared to other countries. Our inflation levels are lower. But you see, there is this question of inequality. GDP does not tell you anything about inequality and what is happening to distribution of wealth. Now, that happens to be, uh, India happens to be a very unequal country. And uh, the poor people, the workers in the unorganized sector, uh, agricultural laborers, etc., women are not benefiting from employment opportunities and uh, income generation activities, which are primarily concentrated in the organized sector. So a lot of India continues to be very poor, as Mr. Yondris mentioned, uh, despite the growth in GDP and despite uh, five trillion economy, etc., you know, the promise of that. Uh, a large majority of India continues to be very poor. Now, whether, um, you know, 75% of rural India needs uh, grains at 2 rupees or 3 rupees is a different point. But we must acknowledge that, um, that our growth is not equitous growth and a lot more effort and policy changes are needed to uh, address this question of inequality. Thank you. Thank you to both our panelists for being on the show. And I urge all the viewers to do your own research and understand deeply about this act because this does not only affect rural India, malnutrition, but also affects the food economy and our thalis. So thank you for being with us and watching the show. The Wire hopes to bring you more shows in the future soon. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.